So welcome everyone to our, this is our monthly Women in Money series that we typically do for the National Alumni Association of Spelman for the Atlanta chapter. And tonight we have a very, very special collaboration with Albany State University and their Women, women in Money series providing women with important information on home ownership, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy that is actually sponsored by the Center for Educational Opportunity. And so we have some very special guests with us this evening that you will meet. Um, number one is our own Kathleen Edward Mons, who is the founding director of the Center for Educational Opportunity. And tonight we are collaborating with them because both Jennifer and I have been working with them to do um, to participate in this series dealing with budgeting, um, investment. And so we thought it would be a great opportunity to bring the groups together based on a HUD grant that um, Kathleena has at Albany State. And this program is funded by a grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in partnership with the Georgia Department of Community Affairs for the HUD Housing and Financial Literacy Grant. The overall goal of this two-year program, so we probably will see each other again, is to provide comprehensive evidence-based results-driven programming designed to improve the financial well-being of community and constituents. And at this point, Kathleen, come off or come on camera and just wave to us, please. Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate you and Jennifer. I'm looking forward to this evening. Outstanding. So tonight, ladies, for those Spelmanites that are on, you are accustomed to seeing and hearing from Jennifer and uh, me, and it will be no different for tonight. We are going to split up the evening in the following way. Um, Jennifer is going to go through the investing module uh, along with an activity, and that activity is our typical presentations to see what you have learned along the way. And then I'm gonna wrap it up with budgeting activity, tie in for those of you that were able to participate yesterday in our um, real estate tour of Forest Park. We're gonna talk about how do you get your budget ready to um, get financed, you know, to get a mortgage, right? Whether it's for single home ownership or for actually buying a, you know, a multiple dwelling, a multifamily dwelling, okay? At the end of this session, we will do an evaluation and wrap up, and we're going to ask you to fill out an evaluation. We have a QR code that we want to make sure that um, we share with you, and then Jennifer will give us some next steps. Does that sound like a, like a go? It absolutely does. <laughs> okay, everyone's good there. I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you, Jennifer. Awesome, awesome. Good evening and welcome. And I'm so excited to see, um, I, I don't really see your faces, but your name. And I definitely have missed meeting with you all. Um, and we, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately had to miss uh, our, our February meeting for some technical difficulties, but I'm so glad we're back together. And so we, we, we are so excited that we get a chance to do this hybrid that we're doing together um, along with Albany State University and our sister, um, Dr. Kathleena Edward Mons. And so, and I think um, Kathleena, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I think you've been rocking with us really since the beginning. You, you might be one of our founding um, members. Yeah, I mean, hey, you, you all are it. And so I'm just delighted to be a part of the partnership and so happy to have you and Adrian to, to support the work at Albany State. So yes, we're, we're, we're here. We've been here for a while. <laughs> well, awesome. So I'm going to kick it off. I, we have a big assignment that we've been talking about for a few months now. And so, but before we get into the actual assignment piece, I want us to talk about um, stock investing. So I want us to go back to the basics, right? So that we can understand this work that we are doing. And then I do have a bit of an activity. It's going to be short. It's going to be something that I'm going to ask you to screenshot because we're not going to have time to do it together tonight. But I think it's so, so, so important when we think about foundationally um, in anything that we prepare to spend money on, how we think about money, okay? Whether it's saving for a down payment on a house, 
whether you are actually wanting to contribute more to your investments, it's really, really important how we think about money. Okay. So let's start taking a look. Um, when we think about investing, we think about investing in securities and securities come in a number of different flavors, right? There's a, I say flavors, but really the technical term is asset classes, right? And so look, you can buy stocks, you can buy bonds, mutual funds, options, commodities, there's alternative investments that encompasses a whole lot of things, right? Real estate can fit into that. Um, real estate investment trust, cryptocurrencies fit into that. Some of these things we have together, um, for those of you that have been with us since the beginning. And so tonight we're going to talk about stock investing, okay? And so stocks, a good investor commits to learning about the company before investing in stocks, right? So if you want to begin investing in stocks more regularly, my encouragement to you is that you get curious about that company, okay? And sometimes the easiest thing to do is to get curious about the things that you're already buying as a consumer. Like maybe you're into, you know, um, Nike, you know, sneakers. And so get curious. If you're already putting your money in Nike as a consumer, why not actually have some ownership in the company as well, right? So get curious even at the, you know, if you're a beginner in the investment space about just look around your house and look at your cereal boxes, look at your shampoo, right? Uh, look at the things you're already buying and get curious about the companies that you already spend your money with, right? A prudent investor gathers information in order to evaluate the stocks. And then a savvy investor decides that, hey, maybe I want to go a little bit deeper. And, and when you go deeper, there's some other things that you can find out, okay? We're, we're going to reach on those things so that you know what they are. But my encouragement is that you get curious about this stuff, right? Because it can only help you. Um, a knowledgeable investor understands the value of stocks do decline periodically. Listen, everything isn't up, up, up all the time, right? So knowing um, that you, if you want to be an investor, you got to understand that, look, the market goes up and the market goes down. That is natural. It happens and it happens a lot. We're going to talk about that later. I'm going to show you that later, actually. And then those that become great investors know that over the long term and based on histories, stocks have always made a comeback and they've made a comeback in, in the form of gains. That means that your value, the capital appreciation of what you have purchased has increased right? And so that happens over time. I would say that, look, in short periods, you know, less than three years, it's going to be very, very, very up and down. I mean, we've seen that really over the last year and a half, right? Um, a very, very choppy market that happens in the short term. But when we go longer term, that's where you really start to see some gains, okay? So look, this is one of my favorite, favorite charts because it shows you that up and down called the volatility of of the stock market and so this um graph shows us that hey if you invested ten thousand dollars one time in the stock market december of 1991 and held it for 30 years at the end of 2021 that one time investment of ten thousand dollars was worth two hundred and eight thousand dollars which is a 10.6 percent return y'all look one of the goals that I talk about when I meet with my clients, when I um, do workshops is we need to talk about returns, okay? In investing, there are a couple of things that matter. There are th really three big things that matter. One is when you start, right? The sooner you start investing, the sooner you start putting away, the, the, the less you have to invest over time, right? You have a longer time period, so you don't have to save as much or you don't have to invest as much out of your monthly budget um, as if you waited until later in life, right? The closer you get to retirement um, that you haven't started investing, the more you are actually gonna have to put away. The second thing is how much you can put away, right? How much can you commit to for your plan. Adrian, if you can take a look, I think somebody is unmuted. I hear like a lot of background. Um, okay. If we can mute that out, that would be great. 
Um, it, how much can you commit, right? That mostly is dictated by your budget. We're gonna talk about budgets later on. And so that we can't control as much, right? Hopefully, you know, you, maybe you, you decide you're gonna cut out some things because investing in your future is more important maybe than cable TV, right? Having all the channels that are available, right? Um, or maybe it's something else. Maybe you're, you're gonna delay gratification for a period of time so that you can invest in your future, okay? And then the third thing, and I think the thing that we don't talk about enough is your rate of return. So maybe you're, you've started early or maybe you haven't. Maybe you have some money to commit to and may, for some people it's over $1,000 a month. For some people it may be $50 a month, right? And then everybody else is somewhere in between that's dictated by your budget. But the third thing is, your rate of return. And listen, I am super, I love working with women. I try to work with women as much as possible um, because I think there's a lot of things that we have to navigate in this world um, between when we show up, when we decide if we're gonna have kids or, or we're gonna partner up, how our career looks. And then when the Lord calls us home um, and, and for us, listen, rate of return matters, okay? That is that matters because if we can get into double digits, it becomes a supercharger. It becomes like that turbo boost to our money. So it, it shortens how fast your money compounds. And that's a big deal. I always am trying to seek ways to get us double digit returns. So this graph shows us over this 30 year period, what do you guys see? I hope you see that there's something going on all the time, right? There is every year, there is something going on in the world that can cause the stock market to go up or to go down, okay? But I hope what you take from this is if you look at where the stock market was in 1992 and where it ended in 2021, that it was way higher than where it was in 1992, right? So it has been going up. So even though what happened in 2022 where the market had a lot of woo, uncertainty, right? inflation, all the stuff that's going on, supply chain issues, labor issues, the war in Ukraine, the craziness in our political system, all of that, it is still, still so much higher than it was, you know, at really at any point. We can go to 2010, 2000, so it's much, much higher, y'all. Um, so that's the one thing, and that my encouragement is that you invest with your head and not with the headlines, right? Stay off of CNN for constant negative news, right? Stop in the short, focus on your goals. That's the big thing. What are you looking for? And then this just says, look, sometimes people are like, oh, you need to invest in emerging markets because that's hot. Or you need to invest in, um, in government securities or you need to invest in REITs, right? And so what this chart shows you that we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know what's going to be hot in any given year. So the top line of those years shows you what actually outperformed in those years. We have no idea. I know Adrienne is smiling because she says, listen, real estate is up there more than anything else, right? So anyways, <laughs> I already saw that smile. Um, but y'all, there's no crystal ball. So it's about investing on a consistent basis. Um, the next thing is... Uh, I'm going to skip through that. Oh, Jennifer. So why do companies issue stock, right? So these are some of the reasons companies, they issue stock to raise money to expand the business in some way, right? They don't have to repay shareholders for their, their investments. Um, uh, you know, so like companies can either issue stock or they can issue bonds, which are loans, right? To their, to investors. And so with stocks, they don't have to repay you for that money infusion they get in, right? Because in exchange for that investment into that company, you have some ownership interest in that company, right? Um, companies can issue dividends. We're not really going to talk about dividends today, but dividends are sort of like a bonus that companies, um, if they're not growing in the same way and they have a lot of extra money or like profits, they can either choose to reinvest it to keep growing the company or a portion of those they can actually give back to their investors as a dividend quarterly, as a bonus for doing well, right? 
They're not mandatory. Um, the companies that issue a dividend will distribute 30 to 60% of earnings to its shareholders. Um, and mostly you will see that companies that do issue dividends, that do issue div dividends are companies that are consi considered um, value stocks. So they, they produce something consumable usually, and they've been around for a long time. Um, so what's in it for investors? So why should I invest, Jennifer? Because look, what I've been hearing in the news has been crazy. I don't know how I feel. You know, like when COVID first came out, I was scared and I pulled some of my money out of my 401k because I was just, if you did that, I'm, listen, I'm not judging, but if you did that, that next month when the market dipped 34%, when we had the shutdown, it came right back up and it ended that year amazingly. Okay. Um, and so look, we invest for wealth creation. We invest to diversify. Look, it's about diversification. Maybe real estate is absolutely 100% what you love, but also you don't have to put all your eggs in, in one basket. It's okay to diversify some of your holdings or asset holdings. Uh, you can get income from dividends, right? We just talked about that. Stock value appreciation. That means, listen, y'all, I am not giving you any advice tonight at all. But when the markets are down, those are usually buying opportunities, which means that if you do your research, you are actually buying a stock, if it, if, if it's, if it makes sense, a lot lower um, and at a better price, which is like a discount, y'all. And that's when people's wealth is actually created. It's you're supposed to buy low, 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 and sell high. And so some of y'all are saying, man, but this really makes me really uncomfortable. But this is when people's wealth is actually created, okay? In times like this, when the market is choppy, when people are scared, they retreat away. And then other people become opportunistic and say, you know what? There's some value right there because that thing is going to pop back up, okay? Okay. Um, and then the increased value when stock splits. So a couple of key metrics um, to just talk about. For those of you that are really, really interested and curious about investing, some of the you may want to look at. I want to point you today to market cap because our investment presentations that we're going to be making the decision on for our investments tonight really are dealing with the market capitalization, which is the value of the company if you multiply the total number of outstanding shares by the company's current share price, okay? So there's an example right there, but small cap stocks are those with values between 250 million and $2 billion. A mid cap capitalization stock are those with values between 2 billion and 10 billion. And a large cap stock are, are those companies that are greater than $10 billion, okay? And tonight we're gonna talk about one of each of those, okay? Sectors, there are 11 different sectors in the stock market, okay? We just talked about dividends. Um, I will share this presentation with you all so that, that you have it. I think I may have shared it before, but I'm okay sharing it. Um, revenue, what is revenue times? Look, y'all, we want to make investing easier because it's not that complicated. We don't need to overcomplicate it. If people, if your financial advisor, if, if anyone in your financial realm is talking over your head and will not explain things in a way that can actually make sense of this stuff for you, because there's, there's easier ways to understand. But here, I just have some explanations, right? And I'm going to point you to net income because what's highlighted and bolded there says net income may be a better indicator of growth of a company. So you all, we have these cheat sheets that we have today that we didn't used to have in the past called um, Yahoo Finance and Finance and some other ones that you can actually go and look. And those Yahoo Finance gives you like all the details for whatever company, as long as you have the ticker symbol, they, they give you the entire financial history. So you can go and eyeball and say, oh, wow, look at that. That company has been growing their net income year over year. They've been growing their revenue year over. You don't have to do any, right? To do any calculations, it's already been done. Um, to just point you through that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep running through here. And what I want you to focus on is, you know, what's bolded there kind of gives you an indication of, hey, what are some things I should consider? So the price to earnings ratio, which tells you what investors are paying for the stock, 
in relation to its earnings, it says a low price to earnings ratio may indicate that a stock is underpriced. Um, or it may be an accurate reflection of a company with limited prospects, okay? So that's something to consider. The price to sales ratio compares a, stock, a company's stock price to its revenues, right? Or its sales. And so comparing um, that price to sales ratio for companies in the same industry, right? Comparing apples to apples helps give you a sense of which ones may be undervalued, okay? And then the debt to equity ratio, that one probably is the most intuitive, right? Some debt is normal, but a company that has a lot of debt, I mean, it's like a person with a lot of debt, right? A high debt to, a debt to equity ratio may be a sign that the company is way in, way over its head, okay? So let's not overcomplicate this stuff. Um, the beta, sometimes you may, may hear references if you listen, if you go on MSNBC or if you listen to any of the financial channels or read. Um, the beta is really talking about how volatile that stock is, okay? So how much movement is happening, you know, on any given time in that. If it's lower than one, then that's pretty good. That means it's a lower volatility stock. If it's higher than one, then that's you, man. Listen, put on your seatbelts, strap it up, because you're gonna be on a roller coaster, okay? Um, and so the assignment that we covered, you know, that we covered, we started in November and we've continued on. We gave you a heads up on the companies was to choose a small, mid, or large cap stock to research and then compare so that you can make your investment this evening, right? And so we're about to transition into those presentations because remember, we are looking in terms of a large cap stock. We are looking at McDonald's. So we're in the, the, the industry, you know, the food industry, McDonald's. Um, we are looking for the mid cap stock, Wingstop. And then small cap, we're looking at Chewy's. And so that's what we, um, sent out last time. But listen, I wanted to give you another assignment and I want you to screenshot what is on your screen because I think what is super, super important is we got to go and peel back the onion a little bit in anything that we're about to do or spend our money on. And it's to find out you personally, I want you to do this for you because I need you to start digging into why you make some of the decisions that you do. Adrian and I talked about that this year, we're going to get personal, right? And getting personal means we need to look at some things, look under the hood, right? And so money plays into all aspects of a person's life. It's woven into our relationships, our dreams, fears, successes, failures, struggles. How you feel about money is generally shaped by whatever your experiences have been up to this point, right? May have been your parents, your grandparents, your spouse, your partner, right? Friends, teachers, all of that helps to shape how we think about money, how we spend money, how we perceive money, how we feel about money. And so look, screenshot this because I want to know, I want you to know what is your money script? You know, who are you? Are you money reverence, right? These are individuals that are convinced that more money will solve all their problems. I just make more money. It'll make me happier. I just know it, right? My life will be better. Um, Maybe you're about money status, right? These individuals believe that owning the newest and best thing gives them that status. Maybe that's sort of your money mindset. Maybe you're a money avoider, right? I know I know some people that are money avoiders. People with this trait believe that money is bad, that wealthy people are greedy and they don't deserve money. Or maybe it's money vigilance, right? Which means that you embrace frugality, you're committed to saving and are discreet about how much um, you make or how much you save, right? How much you have. Um, so I need you to identify that. That's really, really important. So you can start to understand why you make some of the decisions you do. And then this is the other thing. Again, I can send this out, but if you wanna go ahead and screenshot this and you wanna um, figure out what's your personal money story, man, do the work to dig in there, right? Because whatever your influences have been have created who you are. So who are your influences? Who's been the most influential in your financial journey and why? Listen, they, they can be positive or negative, okay? What about your memories? Think about, think back to what are your earliest memories of money and list some of those positives or negatives. Some of us have had experiences growing up 
where our parents fought about money, right? Like that was the biggest source. Mm -hmm. So think about how that has affected you. And then what are your scripts? What do you tell yourself in your head? What are your, those beliefs conscious or unconscious about money? Are they positive? And if they're not, how do we go about changing them so that every time something pops into your head, like, oh yeah, you know, she thinks money just grows on trees. Or oh, I know she's talking about all that success. Think, catch yourself. I want you to catch yourself as you're having some of these thoughts, okay? So this is some homework to do for you. Um, and so that's it for this part. Uh, so I'm gonna stop right there. Are there any questions before we move through this? Jennifer, I think that was great. Um, I would ask people to use the chat and tell us what type of, what is their money mindset now? Because they probably know just based on those um, four definitions that you had. So if you all want to drop it in the chat. Yes, if you, you know by reading these, who you are, drop it in the chat. Listen, this is a no judgment zone. I do believe that, man, once you know, once we know what we are, we can start addressing to get right if there's if, if there's an issue if there's a way we could get better let's just identify that area that we can get better at and maybe you're doing great maybe you have some awesome traits but i have this up here for right now so go ahead and just drop that in the chat is dawn on i am here hey yes. dawn. hey <laughs> all right so we want to go ahead and move through and let's talk about our large, mid, and small cap stocks. So I'm kicking it off to you, Don. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here and get us started. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. All righty. So I'm talking about McDonald's. <laughs> so I'm starting here with just a brief overview of McDonald's. Has anyone seen that movie? the founder. It's about McDonald's. <laughs> um, and it's so, really good. Yeah, it's a really good movie. So you might want to check it out. It's based on some of the true history of how McDonald's came to be. Um, but this just shares a little bit of the, the overview um, of what has happened with the company over the years. I will not read any of that. But when you, this is just an example of when you are doing research on a company, this is some of the general information you definitely want to to look at. And to get this information, so McDonald's, you may pick McDonald's, you may want to invest in some other stock after tonight's presentation and do research on your own. I looked at the company's latest annual report, and the only one that the latest available was 2021. I thought it was surprising that 2022 wasn't available yet, um, but this is from their 2021 annual report and from um, their website. So now we're going to look at some of their financials. Um, some of their financials here, so their revenue. Uh, Jennifer talked about uh, looking at what a company's revenue is, and for 2021, they had over 23 million <laughs> in revenue, and that compared, that was an increase of 21% from the prior year, 2020, um, and their operating costs and expenses, so you want to look at what they're bringing in, what's going out the door, basic stuff. Think of this, I love when Jennifer was, saying, Jennifer was saying, don't make this complicated. When you look at your own income and expenses, think of when you're looking at a company, some of those same basic principles still apply. So looking at the company's revenue and then looking at their expenses and their expenses increased by 8% in 2021 from the prior year. So that's something you definitely wanna look at. Um, I like this slide because, <laughs> Um, in the annual, so when you are looking at the company's annual report in their website, right, you got to consider the source. They're going to put information there that is going to highlight what makes them look good. This information was not on the McDonald's website and in their annual report because guess what? They're not topping these um, industry performance performance of, uh, you know, ratings right here. So we're going to have a presentation on this is Wingstop later tonight. And you see they are outperforming in these uh, in this industry, in the food fast food industry. So 
when you're researching companies, make sure that you are considering the source and you're looking for information that, you know, isn't just from the company because they're just going to tell you what's been great <laughs> about the company. So this is their, the McDonald's stock performance graph. And in their annual report, they are showing because in 2021, they their, or, or the past five year return, it's been great. They, according to McDonald's, they have been outperforming both the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones in the past five years in terms of their, um, their stock performance. Um, so you definitely want to look at those information graphs. This is their team, their leadership team. I definitely look for diversity. I look for brown faces. <laughs> and it's nice to see be here. I, I see some here. And I also look for women. So they've got a good number of women here too. Um, but as anything in <laughs> in our world, um, mostly it's it's white men that are there um, when you're looking at this kind of stuff. Um, so in conclusion here, so everything so far I have shared with what McDonald's has said. On this screen, I am sharing what sort of an outsider industry analyst, several websites have said about how, you know, their stock is performing. So for right now, they're saying if you have it already, hold McDonald's. That's their ticker, MCD. That's the McDonald's stock ticker. So if you have it already, hold it because they're expecting returns um, from the markets in the future. Um, but I want to look at that second bullet there. Um, the valuation it's showing, it says that the, Madonna, the McDonald's Corporation may be overvalued. What does that mean? Overvalued. So think when you're going to buy something. Right now, because it's hot, it's in the news, they're going to jack up the price. So that's kind of what overvalued means. Right now, it's selling for more than what this analy these analysts say it's worth. So right now, it's overvalued. You're not getting that discount Jennifer was talking about earlier. It's not McDonald's stocks currently is not on sale. Um, and then the financial health and growth of the prospects of McDonald's um, demonstrate that it's potential to underperform the market. So remember, I showed you uh, here that they have been outperforming the market for the last five years. But these industry analysts are saying that they have the potential. Again, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know for sure what's gonna happen, but they have a potential to underperform the market. And I included the links there um, for, and they're good for looking at other stock too, Zacks and, and Seeking Alpha. Um, I think that's it. That's it for me. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. Um, Don, um, if you think about uh, when you when you're talking about a large cap stock, which McDonald's is a large cap company because they're over that 10 billion, right, right. Um, or more, what are you know in terms of room for growth? Do you think that large cap stocks have a lot of room for growth as compared to a small or mid cap company? Like, how how do you what do you what are your thoughts on that? Right. So the core of what Jennifer is asking is, so a large cap stock is an established company, generally. They've been around. And so, you know, they may not have a lot of room to grow. They may, McDonald's has been around for how many years? <laughs> so, you know, how many more times can they find something new and hot, some new angle to come at us with to make us want to buy more, you know, more of their product. Um, so that's kind of what this question is getting at versus a new and up and coming fast food chain where they're new. And so because they're new, they've got a lot of space to grow potentially if they had the capacity to do so. Um, so I, I think it's really an individual and in, in with all types of investments, it's really a personal decision. Personally, I feel like, I mean, on one hand, you can say McDonald's has been around forever. It's not going anywhere. All these new and up and coming fast food chains, they come, but no one has a staying power like a McDonald's. You know, will Wingstop be here, you know, in 10 years or 40 years or 50 years like McDonald's has been around for as long as that McDonald's has been around. So it's really a weighing of all of those things. Um, and which is to your point, Jennifer, diversification matters. So don't just have your 
large cap, the big, you know, known, you know, household names, diversify your portfolio with have some of that, have some of that mid stock, have some of mid cap, have some of that small cap. So I, I think that's probably the safest bet to go or the advice I would share. <laughs> Thank you. So Jennifer, much. I want to just add okay. something in that. Um, as you're doing additional research, what you may want to start to look at is where those companies are investing for their own internal diversification. For example, you'll see a company like m and Mars, they're investing more in agricultural businesses that are ancillary to their core business of candy. So, and they also, I don't know why yet, why they invest. They're the largest owner of veterinarian hospital, animal hospitals across the country as well. Not sure why, but you may, as you dig deeper, you may begin to see, especially for larger cap um, stocks, that they are looking at internal diversification. Yes, absolutely. And along those same lines, well, you know, just in tandem with what Adrian just said is McDonald's. Many people think McDonald's is a burger joint. You know, it's a burger franchise. McDonald's is really a real estate, a real estate company. company. Yeah, exactly. um, that happens to sell burgers. Okay, um, so so they they are, gosh, probably one of the largest holders of real estate in the entire world. Um, right. So so that just happens to sell burgers and fries. So thank you, Don. I really appreciate you. Well, Great you're job. welcome. <laughs> All right. So I am going to talk to us. Oh, so that was the large cap stock, McDonald's and name, you know, this next one, I'm pretty sure you also know a couple of things I'm going to point out here without reading the whole thing. They were founded in 94 in Dallas, Texas. They've got more than 1900 locations worldwide. So they're not just here in the U.S. Um, their uh, their system wide sales increased in 2022 by over 16, almost 17 percent. Okay, which is the 19th year, a consecutive year of of store sales, same store sales growth. I think that's kind of a big deal. Um, they uh, have won these awards, but on the other side, what you see there is they have a section um, in both their annual report, but also on their website um, that they. Every month they're highlighting something new. And I love that when it comes to Don talked about diversity, right? Diversity in their management team, right? The executive team, but also what sorts of things are you celebrating for your end customer, right? Like what's important because the people who are out here buying wings, I mean, I think everybody loves wings, just period. But what are those things that you're are important to your consumers? And are you celebrating some of that, right? So are you kind of putting... You know, we know you're in the neighborhoods, but are you putting money into, are you celebrating some of those differences in diversity? I thought this was really interesting. So they have something that they are celebrating that to them is really, really important, okay? So let's talk about the financial results. All of our presentations are gonna look very, very similar, right? So in terms of revenue um, for 2022, it uh, revenue was 357 million. That was increased by 75 million or 26% compared to 2021. Okay. Their cost of sales, which is a variable number, what it costs to produce um, the end product, right? So there's a lot of things that go into that, right? For wings, you know, the chickens and, and the location of the chicken. Listen, y'all, 2020. Um, 2021 and 2022, wings were out of control. The price of wings, right? Uh, just the raw wings, okay? And so look, that's a variable number, okay? Um, so the cost of sales increased to 63 million from 57 million in 2021 and included almost a million dollars and half a million dollars in pre-opening expenses. So that cost of sale also includes the store openings, right? So those are their variable costs that are involved in producing those wings, right? And then um, the S, G, and A expenses, um, the expense was 67 million in 2022, an increase of 4.2 million or 6.6% compared to 62.9 million in 2021. So their expenses went up, right, over, the, over that year by 4.2 million. That was primarily due to an increase of headcount. Um, that's amazing to me 
in a time, so $4 million they really spent in headcount when everybody was having labor supply, uh, uh, th there was labor issues, right? Like nobody wanted to work, they couldn't find, every restaurant, every fast food restaurant had help wanted, everybody was paying $15 an hour. And so that could have been also what accounted for that increase in headcount is that they ended up having to commit to paying more money for that labor. And sometimes they, but and, and one of those forms of committing to more money could have been a lot of restaurants, even fast food restaurants committed to paying bonuses if you stayed for a certain period of time, right? Like bonuses y'all for fast food. Um, and then interest expense, right? So is what's what are they spending on their debt that they are, are servicing? Um, interest expense was 21.2 million in 2022. It increased by 6 million or 41% compared to 15 million in 2021. Things that are sort of out of the norm should cause you to ask questions like, that's sort of kind of a big jump, 41% more than the year prior. That's a big jump. That should cause you to ask questions. It says the increase was due to the securitized financing transaction that was completed in March 2022. So they did a big transaction. So that was a big portion, uh, which increased their outstanding debt. So taking a look, remember, we need to look at that debt to equity to see if we also feel like we're comfortable with that, okay? With where the company is going. And so you saw Don show this. This um, is Wingstop. Look, their same store sales growth over five years has continued to move and outperform other fast food restaurants. Some that we know, all of them we recognize, right? And so they have been on a tear. Their, their five-year CAGR, which is the compounded annual growth rate from 2016 to 2021, um, you, you see that it's also, they're also outperforming there. Um, this slide here, diversifying quick service restaurant users. So they are taking a look, they were measuring where their growth was coming from, right? And so their core customer, right? There, the, there's growth in there from the ethnic diversity of their core customers, but they also saw growth from weekenders, right? So they started to sample some new segments and they said, hey, we've seen much more growth than people just coming in on the weekends, right? Having wings Fridays and Saturday nights, right? But they didn't do so well with suburbanites, right? Um, in terms of income, their core customers, they didn't see a huge change between how much money they were spending at their stores, but they saw that those weekenders and the suburbanites um, uh, were actually spending a lot more, okay? When they started tracking that, families, so families um, are core, part of their core customers, right? And so there was an increase in families. Um, not a lot of families that come up on the weekends. I don't understand because he loves Wingstop. Um, so anyways, um, and then suburbanite families, also there was an increase there, all right? Also the ethnic diversity shows you suburbanites maybe tend not to be people of color, all right? Um, so I thought that was very, very interesting. The other thing is, you know, looking at digital sales, so versus their competitors, they have seen really since over the last five years that their digital sales have begun increasing and they really started to take off during COVID, right? Where everyone was ordering. And so digital sales is measured by you placing an order either through their app or through the website. Um, and then you go pick it up or you have it delivered, but that's what they count as digital sales. And over the last five years, they've increased and really took off during COVID. And they still continue to see that digital sales, I mean, they don't, they don't show those slowing at all. Um, you know, outside of Domino's and Papa John's, you know, third in digital sales. This is their team. When I saw this, you know, I'm obviously looking, I think, you know, a year and a half ago, one of the, the teams that presented um, on their stock pick, they made a comment about, hey, I want to invest with company whose management team is diversified. And so that's really, really important to me. Um, and so I don't know if that's important to you, but I want to know the people that are making the decisions at the top, what do they look like? And do they represent the people they serve in any way? So there's one brown face and there's two women. Um, on that score, for me, it's kind of meh, 
right? Like I feel like there's room to grow there. Um, and then in conclusion, so what are analysts saying? Analysts are saying, hey, if you're looking at just holding the stock um, for a short term, so like in the next two to six weeks, eh, I mean, it can go either way, but we, the, you know, the analysts feel really, really, really good if you want to hold it for a midterm, so greater than six weeks up to nine months, and then just longer term period, we, they feel really, really good about the growth prospects of the company. It is a mid cap stock, which means um, that they are, you know, just under a $10 billion company and that there's still tons of room to grow. So they have a lot more opportunities to grow franchises. They have a lot more opportunities to grow their digital sales. Um, and so they have a lot of opportunities, you know, they're, they're experimenting with their spice and sauce mixes still, right? Um, so so the analysts feel really, really good for you owning it, you know, longer than six weeks and really into the future about the prospects of the companies, okay? And with that, I am going to stop my presentation. Um, so that covers mid cap stock. That's our mid cap stock pick for tonight. And then kicking it over to Camille Sanders Patterson, who's going to guide us through her small cap stock. Camille? Good evening, Spelman Sisters. Now, I am not as polished as Don and Jennifer are, but I will um, present our small cap stock consideration. And I will tell you that um, we are looking at Chewy's Holdings. The stock symbol is C-H-U-Y. Um, and it is not as exciting, unfortunately, as McDonald's and Wingstop. Um, however, Chewy's is um, a Tex-Mex restaurant that was founded in Austin, Texas in 1982. Um, it's full service Mexican and Tex-Mex serving authentic and freshly prepared foods. Their menu includes enchiladas, fajitas, tacos, burritos, appetizers, soup, salads, and a wide range of beverage offerings. Their restaurants are uniquely decorated, supporting their model. If you've seen one Chewy's, you've seen one Chewy's. They believe that their employees are the cornerstone of their culture and set the tone for a fun, family-friendly atmosphere with attentive customer service. Their culture is one of their most valuable assets, and they're committed to preserving and continually investing in their culture and their customers' restaurant experience. As of December 2022, they operated 98 restaurants across 17 states with an average annual unit volume of $4.4 million dollars for their 93 comparable restaurants. They are served approximately 47 customers per location per week or 244,000 customers per location per year on average. So I hope you're not hungry um, as we look at all of these pictures of all this um, Tex-Mex food here. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach because there's not a lot of pretty charts and information available for Chewy's. I'm gonna talk about their business strength. Um, they have six that they've noted. One is fresh, authentic Mexican and Tex-Mex inspired cuisine, which we just touched on in the previous slide. Um, they have considerable dining value with broad customer appeal. Their core demographic today has been between ages of 21 and 44, but they do believe that their restaurant appeals to a broad spectrum of customers, and they'll continue to benefit from the trends in their, of, of their consumers' preferences. Um, they believe that they are able to attract a venue for families and large parties. And some of their restaurants are considered actually to be destination locations, drawing customers from um, as far as 30 miles away. They tend to locate their restaurants in high traffic locations to attract primarily local patrons and weekday business travelers. Another business trend is their upbeat atmosphere coupled with irreverent brand help um, helps differentiate their, their business concept. Um, as stated in their motto, if you've seen one, two, as you've seen them all, each of their restaurants are uniquely designed. Their decor, which includes some signature elements in all their restaurants, is sourced from actual vendors in Mexican villages. They believe that the decor, combined with their attentive service from their friendly and energetic employees, create an upbeat ambiance with a funky, eclectic, and somewhat irreverent atmosphere. Their restaurants feature a fun mix of rock and roll music and reflects the characters of their individual communities, which has allowed their customers to develop a strong sense of pride and ownership in their local Chewy's. They actually say that people come back more than one time a week, um, generally, to experience their restaurant um, offerings. They have a deep-rooted, inspiring company culture. They believe, uh, as I mentioned, that their culture is one of their most valuable assets. They're committed to preserving and continually investing in their culture and their restaurant experience. And since they were founded in 1982, they've developed a close personal relationship with their customers, their employees, and their vendors. They emphasize a fun, passionate, and authentic culture and encourage active social responsibility and involvement in local communities. 
the environment and social governance, governance um, I believe is what the ESG stands for. They regularly sponsor a variety of community, community fundraisers, including local charitable events, their annual toy drive with Operation Blue Santa, which is um, in their hometown of Austin, Texas. And they also support the St. Jude Research Hospital specifically in their annual pinup campaign. They have a flexible business model with industry leading economics. They have a long standing track record of consistently producing high average unit volumes relative to competing Mexican concepts, as well as established casual dining restaurants. For the 12 months ended December 2022, their comparable restaurants generated an average unit volume of $4.4 million, with their highest re restaurant generating approximately $9.9 million on their own. They've opened and operated restaurants in Texas, the Southeast, and the Midwest, and achieved attractive rates of return on their invested capital, providing a strong foundation for expansion in both new and existing markets. Finally, they have an experienced management team. They're led by a management team with significant experience in all aspects of restaurant operations. As of December 2022, their senior management team had an average of approximately 38 years of restaurant experience, and 103 of their general and managers had an average tenure at Chewy's of approximately eight years, which I think is pretty sizable for a, a restaurant chain. In 2020, 2007, they hired their current CEO and president, Steve Hislop, who since his arri uh, arrival at Chewy's has opened and operated 90 new restaurants across the U.S. as of December 2022. And speaking of their team, just really quickly, I will tell you that I have not seen, based on the listing of their um, top um, operators or uh, top um, officers, I'm sorry, and the board of directors, they do not have any um, people of color, but they do have one woman. Um, they were founded by John Zapp and Mike Young. Their current CEO and president, as I just mentioned, is Steve Hislop, and he previously served as president of Sam Seltzer Steakhouse and O'Charlie's Restaurant, Ooh. which sounds familiar to us here in Atlanta. John Howie served as CFO of Del Frisco's Restaurant Group and um, Chief Accounting Officer of Lone Star Steakhouse and Saloon. Their COO is John Mountfort, who served as president and CEO of Sam Seltzer Steakhouse after um, Steve Hislop left. VP of Culinary Operations for Cook, uh, Cooker Bar and Grill and Director of Culinary Operations for Houston Restaurants, which sounds familiar to us here in Atlanta as well. And their VP of Real Estate Development is Michael Hatcher. And they mentioned that because they are big on expanding their um, footprint by purchasing um, additional real estate and expanding. Um, their business strategies, um, just to give you an idea of how they're, what direction they're moving in, they're pursuing new business restaurant development. They acquired one new restaurant in 2020, four in 2021. Three in 2022 and plan on opening six to seven new restaurants in 2023. They pride themselves in delivering consistent, comparable restaurant sales to providing high quality food and service by continuing to provide average, uh, attractive price per value propositions for their consumers. And right now, their average plate ranges um, is about $18.14. They're continuing to explore potential additions to their core menu as well as limited time food and drink offerings. So they're having specials um, like most restaurants are doing. And they do pride themselves at keeping their menu pretty much the same since their opening in 1982. Um, they're continuing to promote their brand and drive traffic through local marketing efforts, national digital marketing campaigns, social media influencers, charity partnerships, and broad range line, and through the sale of their broad range line of t-shirts. They prioritize customer service and will continue to invest significantly in ongoing training of their employees as well as their new managers training programs. Finally, they're leveraging their infrastructure. Um, investments have been made in their infrastructure over the past several years, such that now they have the corporate and restaurant level supervisory personnel in place to support their growth plan for the foreseeable future. They believe that their restaurant base, as the restaurant base grows, their general administrative costs are expected to increase at a slower growth rate than their revenue, which in, results in larger profit margin and um, earnings for the company. Okay, now their financial results. Revenue for 2022 was 422.2 million, an increase of 25 million or 6.5% compared to 396.5 million for 2021. The revenue increase is due to a 4.5% growth in, rep, in um, rep restaurant sales, as well as incremental revenue from the additional 110 operating weeks provided by their new restaurants that they opened back in 2021. Their cost of sales increased to 114.9 million from 96.5 million in 2021 a 19.1% increase over 2021. Um, this um, was due primarily to the overall commodity inflation that increased by 19, uh, that I guess was about 90% during the year. Um, cost of sales um, increase was driven by a substantial increase in the cost of beef, 
chicken, produce, cheese, and grocery items, which I think we've all witnessed being consumers um, over the last couple of years since COVID hit. SGNA expenses were $258.3 million in 2022, an increase of $23.1 million or 9.8% compared to $235.2 million in 2021. This is due primarily to the increase in hourly labor rate, inflation of 11%, um, and higher restaurant repair and maintenance costs. These um, costs were partially offset by reduced restaurant pre-opening costs from the prior year. So as a result of COVID, they had to shut down um, several of their restaurants, as most restaurant chains did, and then they reopened those uh, primarily in the 2020, 20, I'm sorry, 2021 timeframe. So by 2022, those costs that they incurred for reopening those restaurants were significantly smaller, which offset the increase in the other SGNA expenses. Um, one thing they did note as a risk factor, um, of course, is the COVID pandemic, and it resulted in mandatory closures and capacity limitations and lowering of their staff. So they're adjusting to this um, by right-sizing their labor model and maximizing their restaurant-level operating profit um, as reduced sales volumes. Um, so they'll continue to manage these risks and uncertainties and um, the challenging labor market and commodity inflation pressures um, to try and adjust and make sure that they're still profitable um, in the foreseeable future. Finally, their interest expense um, net was a negative 0.9 million in 2022 compared to um, 0.1 million in 2021. This decrease was due to the reduction of their debts. They actually received a um, line of credit from, I believe, J.P. Morgan Chase, if I'm not mistaken. And so they were able to um, wipe out their pre-existing debt, and now they have not borrowed against that. So right now their debt um, to equity ratio is very, very small because they have no debt, which is um, a good thing for that company. Um, comparing to their competitors, now again, they don't have the cute flow chart, and as you saw when Jennifer and Don presented, Chewy's was nowhere to be found on that, um, that listing. So I've given a couple of slides with just some comparisons to their competitors, and I will tell you their main competitors are like Denny's, Ruth's Hospitality Group, BJ's Restaurant, um, Baglari, Nathan's Famous, Fiesta Restaurant Group, Red Robin, Gourmet Burgers, Dine Brands Global, Brinker International, and Jack in the Box. Um, for this exercise, though, we'll just um, highlight the top three competitors, BJ's Restaurant, which is BJ's Restaurants and Brew House, not BJ's Warehouse, which is what I initially thought when I saw that, um, Denny's and Ruth's Hospitality Group, which is the Ruth's Chris Steakhouse chain. Um, per this slide here, I just want to point out that um, Chewy's is the fourth based on and, uh, the analyst opinions as far as overall rankings and score. This slide here shows us their market rank um, compared to their top three, three competitors. Um, they're showing that they are, I think I just said that, sorry, fourth based on a competitor. I think I repeated that slide, my apologies. Um, here, we're looking at sales and book value. Chewy's, Chewy's has the lowest annual revenue the highest price per sales and the second highest cash flow per share. Um, and just to note that um, on November 4, 2021, they, um, their board of directors approved the repurchase of a lot of their shares. Um, so here, this is just, that's what's driving their, um, their price per share um, indicated on here compared to their competitors. Our next slide, this just shows profitability and earnings. Chewy's per year had the second lowest net income and earnings per share and had the second highest return on. And then finally, um, the analysts right now um, are saying that all the ratings are pretty much equal in the small cap market um, compared to its competitors. They're all recommending that investors hold their current investments um, until a later. In conclusion, Chewy's is a small cap, is a small cap company, but it's a stable company with a tried and true menu and a loyal customer base. They have plans for new restaurant development, no debt, and a plan to leverage their infrastructure to support their growth plan. They have a vested interest in their employees, customers, and their communities. Their current stock price is $34.76 per share, which is affordable, although I will note that Chewy's does not pay. That was really, really awesome, Camille. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I will say in terms of a small cap, you know, one of the big differences that you saw between Don's, McDonald's, analysis and my wing stop analysis is during COVID, those two companies already had some embedded uh, measures to help them be able to continue to operate in a way, even during COVID. Now that did not, um, th that doesn't mean they didn't have any labor issues. Um, they didn't have issues, you know, with their cost of sales. Um, but in terms of pure model of getting customers in, 
uh, McDonald's and Wingstop, they, they were already there. There wasn't a big pivot that needed to happen. Um, McDonald's had drive through so nobody was coming, coming in, but you could go and drive through and get your food, right? Go through the drive through or you could DoorDash McDonald's, right? Wingstop, listen, their model, very, very small. You, you know, the franchisers are very small with like four or five tables. So they already weren't really meant for you to sit inside. So you could just pick up your food and go. That was already the model. With Chewy's, it's a little bit different, right? They're a sit-down restaurant. They're a smaller sit-down restaurant, right? A small cap um, uh, restaurant and so or, or a small cap stock. And so what you saw is they had some headaches during COVID, but the way they responded, they said, hey, we're not about to open any more restaurants because we don't know how bad this thing is going to get, right? And so they slowed down their growth, which I think was really, really good. They reduced their debt, which I think was really good response. Um, and this is what I'll say about small caps. Look, when we talked about the beta, that volatility in a stock, how, how, how much movement that stock has right in a stock market when news comes out or when anything um is reported uh i'm the small cap stocks are very very volatile okay so they have a lot of movement they give you a lot of heartburn um and so when things are bad they are the first to get hit and they're the first to get hit because they're not they don't have the same insulation that a mid cap stock or cap stock has right their, their, their bank accounts aren't as big, right? Um, and so, so they get hit the hardest when food prices are out of control, when, um, when the supply chain issues hit, the small cap stocks get hit the hardest. So you're gonna see the most volatility, but when the stock market turns around, they turn around the fastest. So I did wanna say that about small cap stocks, okay? So listen, we are closing this part of the presentation down but you have a decision to make and it's a $200 decision and that decision and it's $200 because we have not invested in a few months. And so the decision is, do I invest in McDonald's? Do I invest in Wingstop? Do I invest in Chewy's based on what was presented? And y'all, the answer could be one of the three, two of the three or all of the above. Okay, maybe you liked all of them and you say, hey, Don talked about diversification. I could diversify in each of those buckets. So let's go ahead and start there. However you decide to slice this, whether you believe in one company over the others or whether you think they're all a good bet, um, you need to make a decision to go ahead and invest in your own portfolios based on whatever conviction you had on uh, from these presentations, okay? And so, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so that's coming. Um, I, if I can find the link to take you directly to enter into the, um, the tracking, the track, the investment tracker, thank mm -hmm. you, Adrian. the investment tracker, I will drop it in the chat, but if not, you will get an email tomorrow with that link that will take directly into where you're going to put in, what was your stock pick, how many shares you bought, right? when you bought it, what's your name, all those details are going to be in there. We're going to make it easy for you so that you can go ahead and let us know what you invested in for your own portfolio. Thank you, Jennifer, for taking us to that Absolutely. portion of the presentation. And I am just going to continue moving ahead with budgeting, ladies. This is one of the areas that you all said you wanted to hear information about. So I'm guessing that the majority of the women on here are pretty good budgeters, but just in case, we're gonna do a refresher and help you with a couple of things that you can pay closer attention to. And I wanted to start with big wealth goals require disciplined behavior. And that's really what budgeting is all about, right? It's the practice of training people to obey some rules or a code of behavior using punishment to correct the disobedience. So if you don't budget well, we know what that looks like, right? Depression, sad, can't afford the things that you want, or you're not looking forward to the retirement that we all wanna to get to. This picture here shows that my big wealth goal is to have 100 units, 100 doors is my big goal. 
And so I'm being disciplined so that I can afford to purchase those. Right now, I'm only on 10, but over the next five years, I am, um, I am definitely on a path to get to 100. So as you all start thinking about your big goal or idea, drop it in the chat so we can share and dream together as we focus on becoming more disciplined in our budgeting. One of the things that you may have noticed is in the presentations that just um, were, were presented for companies, a lot of the same practices have to be put in place for us individually. The names may be slightly different. Maybe we use revenue instead of net income, but they really mean the same thing. As you're thinking about your budget components, there are a couple stats that I wanted to share with you all. Number one is that 65% of Americans don't even know what they spent their money on last month. And I'm quiet because that is, you know, an alarming statistic, especially when we have ec economic pressures right now with inflation potentially entering to a recession where we need to know where our dollars are going. In addition to that, one third of Americans regret how they did spend the money that they did have. So we want to kind of help ourselves as women not fall into these practices. And the way that we do it is understanding what are just the basic budget components. Number one is what I call the top line, that's your net income, what you're bringing home. Um, and then your expenses, which are broken down into three different ways. You have your fixed expenses. Those are things that just do not change. Every month, your car payment is probably the same. You have your flexible expenses, meaning your utilities, which fluctuate, fluctuate that you have to uh, deal with every month. Your discretionary expenses are what you decide. It might be a want. You might want to go to the movie. You don't have to do it, but you chose to do it. And then some of us are able to include savings. And those components actually include the budget component. Now, understanding the components, I'm gonna go through this very quickly, but I love the math, right? Because um, a lot of times we do things in such a gross manner, and I use the word gross, because there's a big difference between gross and net. So if we're looking at our net income, it's actually what is hitting your pocket that you can actually spend. It's what you take home every month. And so if you look at the formula there in the minute, in the middle of the page, you see that we get our gross pay and that's what we all celebrate when you get you know, your contract uh, for your salary, your annual salary, minus your deductions are gonna give you your net pay. There are some mandatory deductions that we have no control over. Social security, Medicare, federal income taxes, state income tax, and local income tax. They just happen to disappear from what we have. And then there's some mandatory, the other mandatory deductions are if you have garnishments or child support, and then your voluntary deductions, retirement planning, life insurance, disability insurance, health insurance, and healthcare plans. So if you look at the math, and I want you all to actually do this, if you haven't done it lately, take some time and do it. Start with your gross pay multiply that times 70%. So I'm saying that the government, when we look at all these mandatory deductions in the middle, government's taking about 70% or 30% of that, leaving us with 70% as our net pay, okay? So if you made 50,000 a year and your gross pay, multiply it by 70%, your take-home pay is 35,000 is your net pay. Divide it by 52 weeks, you're gonna get 673 per week, multiply it times four, and that's gonna give you the amount that you're gonna take home, which in this scenario is $26.92 per month. This just takes us through a budget worksheet. If you all wanted to work through it on your own, you can go ahead and open up Excel and plug in some of these numbers. I wanna talk just a little bit about, um, you know, what do we do when our budget, you know, our, our desires exceed maybe what we're bringing home? And so I've added in here the additional monthly income. I love real estate, like investing in real estate. And as a result, I have rental income that I can add into if I were drawing a salary. Anyone that has a side hustle, that too can be included. 
And if you're receiving child support or any other outside income, all of that would be added up to get to your total um, income for each month. Okay, so as we go through and start breaking down some budget details, um, how many people actually use, and Jennifer, you have to help me because I can't see the chat, but how many people actually use a tracking, a budget app or Excel, or I just do it in your head? Tell me what you do by dropping some of those methods in the chat. Jennifer, as they appear, shout them out to me. Anybody? I use Excel and Mint. Camille M says she uses Excel. Kathleen says Excel. So, so far, Excel. Okay, very good. Well, I use Excel and Mint as well, but they're actually budging methods. There are five different methods. And I want to go through these with you all because depending on where you are, what stage of life, you may choose to use a different method. So the first one is zero-based budgeting. Um, and that's what's, it's good for tracking consistent income and expenses. So if you have a very predictable financial setup in your household, zero-based budgeting helps. It also assists with the discipline because it literally is, if I bring in X, I am budgeting to spend or I account for every dollar that goes out that month. And what goes out, it may be a big bucket for savings or investment, but it equates to zero and you are tracking it diligently every month. The second method is pay yourself first budget. And this is where you may have a little bit more debt. So you're prioritizing what you wanna put away towards your debt and what you may wanna put away towards savings or investments. So if you fit into that category, sometimes this is dealing with people that are, um, you know, maybe your kids are just now out of the house and you've done so much to invest in them that you've had higher debt, carrying it on your books. And now it's your time to get rid of that as you prepare for retirement. The envelope system budget. Um, I know a couple of people that use this and sometimes this is what your grandmother used, right? But they're more visual. They actually have envelopes where you write on each envelope at the beginning of the month what you, your budget categories are. So you have an envelope for utilities, you have an envelope for groceries, you have an envelope for your rent or your mortgage, et cetera. You take out cash and you put that cash in every single one of those envelopes. Once that money is gone, you don't cross pollinate, right? It makes you become disciplined by only spending what's in those envelopes. I know a couple of people that use that still today. The 50, 30, 20 budget is really categorizing your needs versus your wants. And these are for individuals that are really starting to look forward towards their goals. You have pretty good discipline and now you can customize by using a percentage-based system to assist you achieve your goals in the long ter term on a shorter basis by simply managing what's going into each of those categories every single month. And the last area is the no budget. And it doesn't mean you don't budget at all. It just means that you probably have done a good job of having a little bit more discretionary income. So you're lowering some of your debt or avoiding debt altogether. So you're using debit cards. When it comes to your house, um, this is more like a, um, a Ramsey method where you're looking to pay off all your debt. So as the money comes in, you have fewer and fewer dollars um, of debt, like credit card, consumer debt. So you're putting it towards um, paying off your larger assets. So what we're gonna focus on is um, the 50, 30, 20 rule for tonight, because this is the one where I mentioned that it's customizable and I wanna make sure that we all understand how it's broken down. So 50% of your budget goes towards your needs. It's your rent, it's your car payment, utilities, groceries, all the things that you need to have paid for in order to sustain your livelihood. The 30% are the things that you actually want to have, okay? 
Um, it's what you do when you go out shopping, taking vacations or streaming services. You don't really need them, but they're things that we like to have to treat ourselves, right? And then that third bucket are our savings or your debt, right? So that savings piece is for emergency funds, retirement, your child's education, and credit card payments. I like the 50-30-20 rule because it's just easy for you to start out with your budgeting to see where you fall with each of these as a guide, okay? For some people, it might be a little bit unrealistic if you have a lot of debt. Like I mentioned, you may have more than 20% of your income going towards debt. But the pro is it's customizable. As long as you think about this, almost like we think about our food groups and what we eat in each of those categories, it's a really good system to actually use. So I'm going to walk you through a scenario um, of a person who makes $35,000 a month. So it's about 65,000 annually. And they have a side business that brings in $250. So they have 37.50 a month. And if you break this down by the 50, 30, 20 rule, there's 1875 that they would use for their needs. Their wants are 1125 and savings and debt, $750. So that's the 50, 30, 20 rule. What you see over here to the right-hand side is um, a customized budget. So I gave you the percentages for 50, 30, 20, but over here, this is an individual that's actually wanting to do a little bit more in terms of saving, right? They want to pay off a little bit more debt. So they're going to, increase what they have to pay for their needs and decrease the wants so that they have a little bit more to shift over into their savings and debt bucket. So the next piece is, well, what do we know? What do we think about with how much should I be spending when it comes to housing, transportation, food, utilities, insurance, et cetera? And so I just gave you all an example. And I think, Jennifer, if you can drop in the link in the chat, it's something that you all can download and just do a gut check, right? To see where are you as it pertains to your own personal budget? And are you meeting these guidelines, either from a minimum standpoint or a maximum standpoint? So for example, if your gross income is 54, 16, 67 a month, which is again, that 65,000 per year, you could spend you know, uh, 25 to 35% of your budget on your housing. So your rent, your mortgage should not exceed 13, 54, 17, okay? On the transportation side, it's 10%, 10 to 15%. And it's 541.67. So what I did in this example was just take the minimum for that budget category of 10%. Food is 10%, utilities, 5%, insurance, 10%, healthcare, et cetera, down the line, okay? And what you end up seeing is um, there are a couple of things that should stand out to you all. Number one, there's always a big debate in the financial community on whether or not you should be using gross or net. Because we already mentioned gross is not really what's coming home for you, right? It's not what is hitting your, your pocket. So it's not what's hitting your pocket. And when it's not hitting your pocket, I like to calculate off of net to determine how much you should be bringing home or spending on your housing budget, transportation. And this requires discipline because at the end of the day, if you want to invest in real estate or in some of these other things, there are other agencies, underwriters that are gonna take a look at your budget to see how well disciplined are you because they have guidelines that you have to fit within in order to qualify for a potential property. Okay, does everyone get that? I'm guessing that I have some thumbs up there. Yes, people are saying yes. We get okay, it. very good. So, so if you dropped that in the chat, could you all just take just a few minutes and fill that out 
and let me know what you're finding when you look at your gross versus your net. And in this example, you'll see that it's almost, call it $1,300, $1,500, right, difference that you could be overspending if you go by what you see out in the public in terms of what you should spend on your various categories. So they need to be plugging in what is appropriate for them. Yes. Right, or what they're spending. That's right. They need to plug in their annual salary and it should be highlighted in yellow yeah. in the top left-hand corner. And then down column A, you put in the percentage that you would like to target for your household. So whether it's the 25 or 30% so that you can see whether or not you're meeting that objective. To go through just a little bit more as we talk about real estate, there were several of you who actually attended the Forest Park real estate tour. And in that, there were several different types of real estate that were provided. And hopefully you're selecting your, pro your property that you'd like to target to potentially acquire. But in doing so, we have to get ourselves ready for what an underwriter might begin to look at. And there's three very basic things. Number one is your credit rating. So we know that we have to be disciplined enough to pay things on time. The second thing that they're going to look at is your housing ratio. And your housing ratio typically cannot exceed 33% of your gross income. So again, just doing the math, it's taking your monthly mortgage payment that you want to be able to hit and divide that by your monthly income. Typically, it's recommended that you don't exceed 28%. But however, what you're going to find is that underwriters and financial houses want your business. And so the guidelines actually exceed what really may be prudent is the 28%. And you'll see that you could qualify for up to 33%, 35%, 40%. Many of you may remember, anybody remember no doc loans back in the day? Remember that? Where you could just say what your income is and just tell them what your numbers are without the discipline. That's why we had that financial crisis in the real estate market. Because that's people, right. That's why, yeah, that's what caused 2008. <laughs> that's right. People really could not afford it. And so as... um fiscally responsible, educated Black women, we have to pay attention to some of the marketing games that will be played with your money to attract you to get into a property that you really cannot afford. And so that's why I put at the bottom of this, really, should you focus on gross or should you focus on net? Because net is really what you have in your pocket. The third piece that an underwriter is probably going to look at is your debt to income ratio. Okay. And here they're going to say that your debt to income ratio should not exceed 40%. Okay. So if you look at your monthly debt, that means student loans, your housing expenses. <clears throat> they're also going to ask you to look at your car payment. Those basic payments. So it won't be all of your expenses. These are the things that they call your debt, okay? And it's basic, student loan, car loan, housing. Those items divided by your monthly income is going to calculate your debt to income ratio. And as long as it's under 35%, you're considered a very good credit risk. Okay. Median debt you see is 35 to 49%. Anything over 50%, if you have 50% of your income going to debt, you're probably going to have a problem. Now, the trickery that also exists in the market is that I mentioned that they're not including all of your expenses, right? And they're asking you to use this calculation based on your top line gross income to say that you can accumulate or acquire additional debt to get to 40%. And you're not bringing home that amount. So we already took out 30% of that income. So you can see how easily 
the numbers come out of whack and they force you into having more consumer debt or potentially getting into, um, you've heard the term being house poor because you've gotten into a house or an investment property that you really um, can't afford when you look at your actual cash. So budgeting basics, definitely set your long-term financial goal. Hopefully it's along the lines of home ownership or real estate investing if you want to become wealthy one day. Um, understand the budget components, income versus expenses, and definitely figure out which of those budgeting methods works best for you. 50, 30, 20 is recommended so that you can customize that and then go back and actually qualify to see where you can make adjustments to fit your situation. There are a couple of resources that you can look at. I like Get Good With Money um, by Tiffany Alici. The One Week Budget is also out there by the Budgetista. And then on the home ownership side, you may have heard of the Neighborhood Assistance Corporation of America. It is a fantastic organization that can help you in two ways. One is with additional education, but the other is they have come up with their own mortgage products. And so if you're, they used to only do your, you had to be a first time home buyer, but now they offer loans, um, mortgages to those looking to invest in multifamily properties or renovation properties. So I would encourage you all to definitely take a look at NACA's program, um, get involved where you can. They make sure that you build the discipline so that you can acquire more assets. That's all that I have on budgeting, but are there any questions? I love this. I'm still working on my, on my spreadsheet, you know, okay. doing my numbers. <laughs> so okay, Jennifer, we will send, just like we'll send out the other items that you sent, um, we'll send out the budgeting information as well, just so that we can be more diligent about paying attention to it especially as it pertains to those next set of goals that we want to have. And if real estate acquisition is in your future, you definitely want to begin paying clo very close attention to this. This, ladies, we just need you in this partnership with Albany State and the Center for Educational Opportunity. Will you please rate this evening? Um, there's going to be a section for the presentation that you heard from Jennifer and our other presenters, and then one for me on the budgeting piece so that we have that evaluation. So I'll give you just a minute to take that down before I stop sharing. And then Jennifer, you can take us through what our next steps are in our next session. Perfect. That was awesome, Adrienne. Ladies, go back to that screen real quick. Um, you guys know what to do with the QR code. Hover your camera app over it and mm -hmm. just press, you know, whatever comes up there. It'll take you to the form. And so it's really, really important for us to get some really good feedback tonight um, from your attendance. So if you just would do that, that would be awesome. Um, the other thing I want to quickly do, uh, this is the March 15th session. So it should be the most recent session that you see on there for March 15th. And that's the one that you will be evaluating. Um, and Andy says, uh, when we get a second, go back two more screens. So if it wasn't Angie, the books, was it the screen be before the informational? So there's the financial management resources. And then the screen before that, what was the screen before that? The, the budgeting basics. basics. Mm -hmm. all the elements that you need to know, making sure that you set your goal, understanding the budget components, understanding true income versus expenses, meaning net income, and then the five budgeting methods, whichever one fits best for you. And I'm recommending the 50-30. So awesome. Um, we're going to go ahead and if you stop sharing now, Adrian. So we know this was a lot of information that way and we absolutely, absolutely appreciate. Um, Kathleena, if you, it, ladies, if any of you are in position, look, I know it's getting late. Some of y'all may uh, maybe prepare yourselves for whatever you're going to do next. But if any of you are in position to actually go on camera really quickly, we would love to just get a quick snapshot 
of yeah. anyone that's out there that's that's okay going on camera really quick, okay? Um, while people are coming on, Jennifer, I just want to ask, I know that um, Sabrina was there yesterday, Camille was there. I want to hear from you all regarding the real estate investment tour, because that was um, Mayor Butler really rolled out the, the blue carpet for us. I will say that. She took us through Forest Park. For those that are not aware, it is actually a... Um, an affordable suburb south of the city, 15 minutes from downtown, very close to the airport. And there are real opportunities to acquire real estate and commercial real estate. So um, we have an inside track ladies <laughs> with the mayor being a Spelmanite and HBCU grad for those that are joining us from Albany State to actually participate. So if there are any comments that anyone would like to share about the experience, what you learned, um, we'd love to hear it. Hi, Adrian. Uh, this is Hi. Sabrina. Uh, yes, very excited to have been able to share in the experience yesterday. I am, well, first and foremost, it was just an honor to be there with our sister mayor. I'm so glad that she did roll out the blue for us because oftentimes people like us don't get those ground floor opportunities. Uh, and so it was just really good for to have a first-hand look at a city that is upcoming. Uh, I liked it because I'm you know, always looking for opportunities and it's close enough um, to the city that people aren't driving too far out, but it's far enough that you don't have the same city tax being in a large metropolitan area. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I think there um, is a lot that we can do in that space. I mean, we've heard about different factions and different people who have co collectively come together to start um, neighborhoods or, or different initiatives. And I think that potentially might be an opportunity for us to just, so just really excited to have been a part of, of what we experienced yesterday. Thank you, Sabrina. I concur with Sabrina. It, it, was, it reminded me of being, getting the inside scoop on an IPO right before it goes public. <laughs> um, you're right there at the beginning, um, you get the ground floor, floor pricing and um, hearing and being able to see firsthand, not looking through pictures, but actually going to the sites where the investments are available was a great experience actually being able to see the land and how much space we're talking about and then think about the, the potential and then the investment that their um, community development office is making um, in actually helping investors with doing demolitions and and um, helping meet them where they are as far as acquire or assuming some of the costs i think was an amazing um, experience and an opportunity for investing thanks camille <clears throat> but I just wanted you all to hear a couple of things because this is unique. I don't know of any other clubs that would have that opportunity to actually go see the location, speak with economic development and partner with other real estate developers. Our Morehouse brothers were there. There were other um, investors that have already participated in that market to begin to talk about what the possibilities are. So I hope that you all, if you didn't make it out, it's not too late um, to actually drive around Forest Park, see what you see and just inquire because we have a direct line to economic development and to the mayor. So if that's of interest to you, please take advantage of it. I can't stress that enough. Okay, we ready for our picture? Yeah, I've already done a screenshot. Oh, you did it. I've yes. done the screen. We didn't get a one, two, three, or anything. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, it was like an action shot, you know? It was an action oh. shot. I mean, I, Sabrina, I think, was, you know, was was giving us the the, the juice on Forest <laughs> Park. So um, uh, there was a question that I had. Um, so, Adrian, there was several questions about how can we get access to recordings um, was, was uh, repeated, like, three different times. Um, I'm not sure if you want to address that. Yes. So Robin, well, for those of you a part of the association, Robin always sends that out. And it will also be on our YouTube page. Um, just search for NASC Atlanta on YouTube and it will be there probably next week because it takes her a minute, you know, to get everything there. And for Kathleen and the initiative with HUD, she will receive a direct link that will go out to that population as well so that we'll cover both bases. 
how many total represented um, from our network in, in terms of numbers there yesterday, Adrian? Oh my gosh, we were oversubscribed. There were like 50 people that showed up and we were supposed to only have 30. So we had two vans and then a caravan of individuals who didn't really RSVP who followed <clears throat> behind. And so you got out at each of the locations the mayor and the economic development person actually explained about each of the individual properties that you were looking at, gave you an opportunity to reimagine that space, especially if it was an empty lot because you could see what's around it. And she was also able to give a little bit of historical context, right, about Forest Park and the things that she would like to see. So if you're interested in um, coffee shops, right, things like that, they are not interested as much in bringing fast food into the spot. They do feel that it's a, a casual dining type of environment versus, you know, a, a Zaxby's or a McDonald's, <laughs> et cetera, for fast food. Um, those opportunities all exist. Dog parks and uh, dog hotels were mentioned. Boutique hotels were mentioned because you're so close to the airport. So really there is a blank slate. And as I think Camille mentioned, there is direct investment opportunity and incentives that they'll be able to provide at least from a tax stand. That's incredible. I love that. I love that. Um, if you all would just take one other quick second before you log off and just post what city and state you're representing, where are you coming in to us from in the chat? That would be amazing. Um, I'm currently sitting in Zephyr Hills, Florida, close to Tampa. Um, I see we have Washington, D.C. So while you guys are posting, let me go ahead and just remind you what our um, homework assignment is. And that is we need to make our stock investments into any of those stocks we presented tonight. Um, I will follow up with an email. My email is going to be delayed. I'm uh, in, in, in Florida for a family funeral, so I may not get to that until Friday or Saturday. Um, but listen, many of you already have my contact info. And so if you want to, I dropped in the chat, it may get lost, but this is what I'm going to need to know, you know, what your investment name is, right? What's the name of the stock you're investing or stocks, the ticker symbol, right? How are they listed on the stock exchange? Um, what your name is, how many shares you're buying, the purchase date. So when you actually buy, if it's tonight, tomorrow, Friday, I'm giving you until this weekend, right, to go ahead and make um, your purchases. But we need to know because we want to keep track of what we're doing as a group. When you purchase it, how much you paid for it, if you had any trade fees, right, if, if the platform you're using is charging you. Um, so, so whatever those fees are and then what the current price is. And so I'll do the current price, but whatever you paid for it really, really important. We need to know. I will follow up with that in an email. But just look, what you purchase, if you want to screenshot it, how much you spent and all that, and just email me um, that, uh, you know, we can get that uploaded, okay? And next reminders, real quick, our next meeting is going to be on April, um, I'm sorry, where are we? April the 19th, third Wednesday in April. That is our next meeting. We are covering index funds and we are going to deep dig deep into some personal stuff again, right? I think we're going to do a little bit more work around our money mindset at that point, but we will be making it some index investing. So the next meeting is April 19th at 6.30. Our last meeting for the year on May the 17th, that is going to be an in-person. So for those of you local to us or that want to get local to us, we're going to be having an in-person final meeting with some food, with some hugs, right? In the way that we do um, with our Spellman sisters. So those are the two dates that we, um, the, the next two meetings that are coming up and what we will be doing. With that, um, I have nothing further, Adrian. And so if you have any parting words <laughs> for us, um, have a great week, you all. Uh, Jennifer, our love goes to you and your family. We're so sorry for your loss. And thank you for your dedication for, for still continuing to do this, because I know that that's, you're pulled in multiple directions. Camille, I see your hand. Really quick, can we drop the, the tickler symbols in the chat for the three we presented tonight? 
Yes, put yours in there and um, Jennifer. Can we McDonald's draw? Oh, okay. The Don just put hers. McDonald's is MCD. Wingstop is Wing. And Chewy's is C-H-U-Y. Thank you, Camille. Ladies, for the association, please make sure that you check your um, emails frequently. We are going into Founders Month. <laughs> and there are a lot of activities starting with the kickoff on April 2nd. We will be in Sisters Chapel at 1 p.m. Please join us for that activity and check naascatlanta.org for any other events. Have a great evening and wonderful rest of your week.